Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast, Episode 146, Keith Finley, Ending Manner of Death Testimony. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is Keith Finley. Keith is a professor of law at the University of Wisconsin Law School and a co-founder of the Wisconsin Innocence Project. Keith is perhaps best known for his extensive scholarship on wrongful convictions and their causes. And among other things, Keith teaches evidence, criminal procedure, and law and forensic science. Our podcast today features Keith's new article, Ending Manner of Death Testimony and Other Opinion Determinations of Crime, which was co-authored with Dean Strang and published last year in the Duquesne Law Review. In it, Keith tackles a problem that we visited a few seasons ago in our episode with ETL Drawer, Medical Examiner Testimony. In particular, Keith looks at the common practice in which medical examiners testify about not only the cause of death, but also the manner of death. As Keith argues, the problem with manner of death testimony is that these opinions almost always involve evidence that goes beyond the medical facts that we might naturally assume that medical examiners use. Manner of death opinions frequently mix medical evidence with other contextual information, such as signs of forced entry, the prior behavior of the victim, or even the presence of a confession by the defendant. Should the legal system accept manner of death testimony when it is based partly on non-scientific facts? Or on the flip side, don't we want medical examiners using all of the available evidence? My conversation with Keith explores these issues and more. Keith, delighted to have you on Excited Utterance. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. I'm really pleased to be with you. Your article, of course, deals with the testimony on manner of death that is often given by medical examiners. To get our discussion started, could you perhaps introduce our audience to the world of medical examiner testimony? What are medical examiners and what are the kinds of testimony that they often provide in court? Sure, medical examiners are typically forensic pathologists. In some jurisdictions, they rely on coroners who need not have any particular medical training at all. But in any event, their task is by statute in death cases to determine a cause and manner of death cause of death, of course, refers to the physiological cause of death, you know, heart attack, poisoning, suffocation, whatever it may be. And manner then goes one step beyond that and assigns one of five accepted categories, which can be either homicide, accident, natural, suicide, or undetermined. And in court, oftentimes, Medical examiners or coroners are called upon to render opinions on both cause and manner of death. And that's the issue we've taken up in our paper. What's essentially the problem here? From a policy standpoint, what's the concern over medical examiner testimony? What's the concern about manner of death testimony? And in fact, does that also extend over to cause of death testimony? Sure. In most cases, cause of death testimony is not going to present an evidentiary problem, although it can on occasion. The biggest problem is manner of death testimony. And the problem is that, of course, medical examiners or coroners as expert witnesses under Rule 702 are given license to testify in ways that most other witnesses may not. They may render opinions. They may base those opinions on inadmissible evidence, including hearsay. And 702 limits them to testifying about things that are both within their expertise that are sufficiently reliable as 
articulated in, in the Daubert trilogy, and that ultimately are helpful to the fact finder, meaning they offer something the fact finder, the jury typically, cannot do itself as well. Cause of death typically is going to pose no problems there because cause of death is typically based upon an assessment of the body or clinical analysis of tissues and fluids from the body to make a determination of was this a poisoning, was this a stabbing, or whatever it may be. And so in that regard, the expert has unique expertise, a sufficiently reliable methodology based on medical science, and does something the jury can't do. I say typically, there are some exceptions that I can describe in a few minutes. Manner of death is very different because manner of death goes beyond an assessment of the medical or scientific evidence presented to the medical examiner and always inevitably requires consideration of what you might think of as ordinary case information, context information, direct or circumstantial evidence. To determine, for example, if we were to take a poisoning example, the medical science can tell us whether death was typically was caused by poisoning, but the medical examiner cannot know from the medical evidence alone whether that poison was taken accidentally, whether it was taken intentionally, which would make it a man or suicide, whether it was forcibly administered, which would make it homicide. The medical evidence simply doesn't tell the medical examiner that at all, and so the medical examiner has to rely on ordinary case information. Was there a suicide note? Was there a hostile relationship with someone else who had a motive to kill? All those kinds of things. Well, that's precisely the kinds of ordinary case information that the medical examiner has no particular expertise in evaluating, that there is no particular scientific methodology for assessing, and that, in fact, the jury is uniquely positioned to evaluate itself. In fact, better positioned to evaluate than the medical examiner because the jury has access to all of the ordinary tools that we use in a trial to ensure reliability of those facts. Witnesses testify under oath. They're subject to cross-examination. The more unreliable claims they make are excluded by the rules of evidence. And the opposing party has the ability to present contrary evidence to the fact finder. None of that is presented to the medical examiner when making those ordinary factual determinations. So this is a long way of saying that opinions about manner of death almost always involve assessment of evidence in a way that is not helpful to the jury because the jury is better positioned to assess that ordinary case information. I think I'm going to anticipate your extension to some of the problematic cause of death cases as well then. Many of the times when a medical examiner is going to talk about cause of death, there's going to be some non-medical evidence that presumably gets mixed into the calculation as well. So if it's a drowning and the person is found in a pool of water, that would suggest or at least be useful evidence for the medical examiner. Are those problematic instances as well in your mind? That's where I say it requires a little bit of case-by-case -case analysis to determine that. So for example, if the medical examiner can tell from the medical examination alone that the lungs are filled with water, the case information may be somewhat useful, but the primary determination can still be made on the basis of the medical analysis itself. So that wouldn't be problematic. But there are other cases where maybe the medical examiner can't tell from the medical evidence itself that the paradigmatic case of that is a case out of the Iowa Supreme Court, uh, State versus Tyler, in which the medical examiner admitted that he couldn't tell from his examination of a dead baby whether the baby was born still or born alive and then drowned, and that to make not only the manner determination, but also the cause determination, he could only make that call when he considered that the child's mother, the defendant, had given conflicting statements to police and ultimately had told them that the child was born alive and that she filled the bathtub to drown him. So in that circumstance, the Iowa Supreme Court correctly, I believe, concluded that even the manner determination was not something that the expert should have been allowed to opine about because it depended on ordinary police provided information that the jury could assess itself. 
So in a way, I agree with you. I think one of the things that has long troubled me about medical examiner testimony is that the opinions don't just rely on the medical evidence, which is what I think ordinary people would expect, but also on these other factors. So things like a confession, which we would think is the realm of what courts do. But despite that intuition, I think there are two significant complications that have bothered me. And both of these complications you talk about in your article, and I'm going to try to take them in turn. So the first is that medical examiners are arguably supposed to account for both the medical evidence as well as this external contextual information because their primary job is to render administrative opinions for vital statistics and other governmental purposes. So the difficulty is that this isn't exactly medical examiners going rogue. These are medical examiners doing precisely the job that they were asked to do. So how do we square that circle? How can we ask medical examiners to stick to just the medical evidence when that's not really what they're supposed to do in their ordinary professional lives? Yeah, you've identified a conundrum here that's presented when medical examiners are opining about cause and manner of death that is real. And it's an argument that is entirely accurate, that in determining particularly manner, which medical examiners and coroners are assigned responsibility for doing by statute in most jurisdictions, they have to consider context information. They have to consider ordinary case information, just as when the jury in the courtroom decides whether something was a homicide or an accident, they have to consider not just medical evidence, but also ordinary context information. That's absolutely true. The answer to that conundrum, though, it seems to me, is that we have to separate the roles that medical examiners are performing in different contexts. When acting as a medical examiner for purposes of uh, filling out the death certificate, for determining cause and and manner of death for the death certificate and for public health statistics, in that context, they, by, by statute, are assigned responsibility for being the ultimate fact finder, for making the determination And therefore, they must be able to consider all of that case-specific context information. It's a very different question, though, when the medical examiner moves into the courtroom, because now the medical examiner is no longer the ultimate fact finder. That is instead the jury or sometimes the judge, right? And so in the courtroom, the medical examiner's warrant is different. The medical examiner is not assigned responsibility there for making all of those ultimate context-specific determinations, but rather for just helping the jury to do that by offering what the jury can't access itself, which is the medical expertise. And so in that situation, the solution that we've proposed is that the medical expert should be free to describe the medical findings and to the extent that cause is appropriate based on those alone to render an opinion about cause, but not to venture into manner, to make a determination that incorporates all of those case-specific context types of, of evidence. And keep in mind, this is not just us saying this. This is actually what forensic pathologists say. They note, and we cite these in our paper, that the reason that they have to consider context information to comply with their statutory responsibility for generating public health statistics, for determining cause and manner of death for the death certificate. But they also say that that does not mean that their determination is scientific or that their determination is correct or that it has any legal significance and that to assume that it does and offer such testimony in court is what forensic pathologist Oliver colorfully describes as an off-label use of the manner determination. The reason they say that it's not appropriate is because they say that the reason that they have to make cause and manner determinations for public health purposes is for generating useful data for public health purposes, for statistics, that kind of thing. And they say that in those circumstances, getting it right in any individual case doesn't really matter. What matters is aggregate statistics. 
And in the vast majority of cases, there's really no dispute about cause or manner of death. It's the very rare case where there's a question, a dispute about cause or manner of death. And among those rare cases, it's even a rarer number of cases that go to litigation in, for example, criminal prosecution. And so what they say is that even if the manner determination is wrong in every one of those contested criminal cases, it makes no difference for purposes of generating population statistics, public health data, because it's the aggregate statistics that matter. But of course, when we move into the law, into the courtroom, getting it right in the individual case is the only thing that matters. And therefore, to assume that because they have a responsibility as ultimate fact finder for generating public health statistics, that that means they also have a warrant from rendering legally significant opinions in the courtroom, it's a non sequitur. It doesn't follow from that. And in fact, most of the forensic pathologists who've written about this complain that that is a misuse of manner determinations. So it's interesting. The second complication that I was going to raise with you was the somewhat odd posture where we say that we want these experts to blind themselves in a certain way, that they only consider certain kinds of evidence and then not consider other types of evidence in making some of their determinations, right? Just do the cause thing with the medical evidence and not talk about the manner. But I think this argument that you raise is really interesting if the opinions about manner are particularly unreliable in the cases that go to trial, then that would give us a good reason to exclude them in these contexts. We're not saying that the medical examiners are normally unreliable because they actually are, as you say, these are, those are the easy cases. But in the hard cases, these are places where we won't necessarily want their opinions. Let's shift gears for a minute and talk a little bit about the law, or at least the black letter doctrine, you've identified problems with this kind of testimony. What's the current state of the law regarding this testimony? What do courts do? Well, we've identified essentially three different patterns, three different trends. Some courts routinely admit cause and manner opinion evidence under the assumption that because medical examiners are assigned the responsibility for determining both Therefore, they have the requisite expertise and it is appropriate for the courtroom. As I've argued, we think they're confusing the purposes for which cause and manner of death testimony is assigned to medical examiners by statute, and that ignores the fact that it's a very different world when the medical examiner gets into the courtroom. Other courts routinely admit cause of death but evaluate manner on a case by case basis. And some courts evaluate both cause and manner, depending on the specific case. And that's uh, exemplified by the Tyler case from Iowa that I I mentioned to you. And typically, under that analysis, cause of death will survive and will be admitted, but manner very often will not. But no court that I'm aware of has established essentially a per se rule, which is what we advocate in our paper, uh, a per se rule excluding manner of death testimony, because Inevitably, in virtually every single case, manner is going to depend to some degree or another on context information, on ordinary case information, and therefore be improper. Cause, we suggest the Tyler Court got it right, should be typically admissible, but evaluated on a case by case basis to determine if the cause determination as well depends too much on ordinary case information, such as information provided by the police. If I'm a lawyer and I want to take up your cause and advocate for a per se rule, what's the best way of accomplishing that result? So I know that you have a bunch of doctrinal proposals in your article, but perhaps just a quick summary or maybe what you think is your most effective line of of reasoning here. Sure. Well, the argument we make in the paper is that our conclusion doesn't require any new rules it just applies a rigorous application of existing rules of evidence and principles of of evidence. And that's because if you just look at the standards for admissibility uh, under 702 and the Daubert Trilogy, for example, we first have to look to whether the proffered expert has requisite expertise. And certainly the expert has expertise in medicine. 
in rendering opinions based on medical findings. Although I will note that <laughs> across medicine, diagnostic error is a significant problem. So we can't just assume that all diagnoses even are correct. But nonetheless, I think we can all agree that medical doctors have the requisite expertise to opine about medical findings. That expertise, however, doesn't extend to interpreting non-medical evidence. They don't have any particular training or methodology there. So as a matter of expertise of the expert, there's a limitation to how far they can go. A second large category of considerations we have to take into account under Daubert is, of course, reliability. Is the principle or the opinion based on a reliable methodology with an acceptable error rate, etc.? And their manner opinion almost always falters because there is no set standard or methodology for incorporating ordinary case information. The conclusions, as the medical examiners themselves say, are not scientific. They're often culturally or locally defined, and they are prone to error. So if we just look at what medical examiners and forensic pathologists themselves say, we realize this is not the kind of reliable scientific opinion that can pass Daubert muster under the reliability standard. And then we turn to, which I've touched on, the final primary argument, which is, is this helpful? And again, as I've said, because the medical examiner or forensic pathologist, when rendering a manner of death opinion, is almost always going to be incorporating ordinary case information that the jury can consider itself fully well, it's not helpful. Indeed, it may be detrimental to the jury's determination of those facts. Why? Because allowing the medical examiner to make a determination of manner of death often is going to result in an unwitting or invisible double counting of that ordinary case information. The medical examiner will consider, for example, whether there was a suicide note in determining whether the poison was ingested accidentally, homicidally, or as an act of suicide. The jury will no doubt then consider that suicide note as well without recognizing necessarily that that suicide note was already considered by the medical examiner in making the manner determination. So in that sense, it skews the jury's consideration of this evidence in ways that may be invisible. So it's ultimately not helpful to the jury. And this is essentially the kind of reasoning that courts that are limiting manner determination in some cases, such as the Tyler Court, and there are other cases that we've cited in the paper, that's the kind of reasoning they have employed. It's a straightforward analysis under Rule 702 and uh, application of Daubert-type principles that if that simply, I think, flows in, inexorably from a straightforward and rigorous application of those principles. We're also seeing it, for example, in other contexts, such as child abuse, typically shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma, where, for example, a Michigan court ruled that it was always improper for a child abuse physician to render an opinion that a child's death was the result of abuse, which would be tantamount to a homicide determination. Why? Because that exceeds the expert's warrant under 702 principles. We also know that the American Law Institute, the ALI, their most recent statement on the law of of the child explicitly states that the things like opinions about whether a child was harmed by abuse is something that an expert should never be allowed to render an opinion on again, because it goes too far and invades the province of the jury. So there is case law that can support these arguments. What we're advocating for is for a more rigorous attention to these concerns and application of the rules of evidence. Well, Keith, thanks for a great discussion on the problems associated with medical examiner testimony. Obviously, a tricky and difficult problem, but I really enjoyed the chance to dig into it. Great having you on the show. Thanks so much, Ed. It was a real pleasure chatting with you about it today. Thanks for airing the issues that we've raised here. As I'm sure was apparent in the interview, I've long struggled with this question of manner of death testimony, or specifically the problem of whether scientific experts like medical examiners should be allowed to use non-scientific evidence in rendering their opinions. On the one hand, It seems natural to assume that a medical examiner's opinion is based on the medical evidence only. 
it's probably quite jarring for you to discover that they make decisions not only on the basis of the medical evidence, but also on the basis of other evidence at the crime scene. Deciding that a death is a homicide because the defendant confessed to the police seems a bit like cheating. But on the other hand, isn't it also perfectly natural for medical examiners to use all of the available evidence? First of all, it's hard to draw lines between what is actually medical and non-medical evidence. And second, as the interview suggests, medical examiners already have to use all of the available evidence in making their administrative determinations. Wouldn't you want to know as a juror what the medical examiner thought was the manner of death? The good news is that courts see this problem and are in the process of struggling to find a balanced approach, perhaps excluding the most egregious cases, but admitting the remainder. It'll be interesting to see what courts and reformers like Keith do as this conversation moves forward. One final thought that we didn't have time for during Keith's interview, but that I talked to Keith about afterwards. One of Keith's principal points in the paper is that medical examiners have expertise about medical things. For example, that the victim died of asphyxiation. But they don't have expertise on questions like who caused the asphyxiation. This distinction, though, is very analogous to one seen in toxic torts. Doctors are trained in differential diagnosis. In other words, determining what disease a patient has so that the doctor can treat that disease. What doctors typically do not do, and that medicine is not particularly focused on, is what's known as differential etiology. What external factors cause that disease? For example, that the disease was caused by a particular chemical. Keith's thesis with regard to medical examiners would therefore suggest that courts should be far more skeptical about medical experts rendering opinions about causation, that is differential etiology, in the toxic tort context. But that's, of course, a controversy for another day. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program, as well as the University of Arkansas School of Law. The associate producer is Alex Nunn, and the production editor is Madeline DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Kyra Hammond, and background music is provided by Kirsten Castle Greer, Felix Wong, and Alex Crew. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you'll join us again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof.